Uh, Jov van Lieshout, hello. Welcome to Design and Dialogue. Hi, Glenn. <laughs> Great to have you with us this morning, this afternoon for you. Uh, you're over in the Netherlands, correct? Yes, I'm uh, in Rotterdam, in my studio. Uh, this is the office downstairs studio. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the ceiling of your studio looks vaguely like one of your works, even. <laughs> <laughs> nice consistency. I wanted to start you uh, by quoting you to yourself. Uh, this is just a short mm -hmm. quote, a few lines that date back a few years, but they seem very relevant right now. So I'll just read this. The, the full quote is, very bad, tabula rasa, much more time, back to basics, necessary reset. Mm -hmm. Little poem. Uh, and it struck me that that was very relevant, at least it feels relevant to me for right now. And I mm -hmm. wonder what you're thinking after this year of um, chaos and disorder in some ways, but also strange focus and mm -hmm. widespread turmoil. What are your thoughts right now, given that you're such a powerful thinker well, on questions of dystopia and utopia? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, actually, this whole time of the pandemia has been very interesting to me. Um, one of the big advantages that is that you had a lot of, I had a lot of time in my studio. So I decided to work uh, uh, seven days a week, more or less, like, you know, take any moment because it's a once in a lifetime possibility I could do. So I have been making sculptures and objects like uh, a madman. And uh, actually I made this not a quote for you. Uh, I would rather make 10,000 bad sculptures than 10 good ones. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, but basically during this time I have been making uh, sculptures that are related to big events in life, like uh, love, uh, death, uh, belief, uh, 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 reproduction. Uh, also, some kind, somehow, uh, there's some parallels with biblical stories, uh, like you know, old stories, uh, or, or like things that are really woven into our culture. And then uh, the last year, I've been working on a, a kind of diorama, uh, like a movie set almost, without the movie then, without the actors, uh, which is called Sacrifice. Um, it's a huge installation. It takes uh, about um, uh, 1,000 square meters, uh, 10,000 square foot, to install everything. And basically, no, it's a it's a diorama, a story of uh, sacrifice. So there's a lot of um, mannequins that I changed the position, uh, mutilated them, or changed them, make clothing, make objects uh, for them, uh, make them in relationship with um, uh, uh, like uh, medical in medical situations, uh, uh, poison gas situations. So it's very much related to. Um, you could say war or terrorism, but also related to hope and friendship. So, uh, well, if you yeah. see it, it's the, the dystopian is closer than the utopian. Yeah. But, uh, but um, so this has been to me, uh, in a way, you could say, like this, this sacrifice. I mean, our generation in the West. So we never had a real crisis. We never had a war situation. We never had to flee our house. We were never hungry. We were never prosecuted. You know, we are kind of like, well, the best, best ever period uh, in the, the history of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and we, we don't have this experience. And on the same hand, I think, I mean, well, this is part of human life. This is part of human existence and uh, we are kind of very spoiled we because well we the biggest choice we have is whether we eat gluten-free or whatever you know <laughs> where to <laughs> which which farm our salads come from mm. so this is our crisis and not a real crisis and if there is something like that they invent an app or a, a, a discussion group or some kind of solution so we don't know what it is to be in a trench and to climb out the trench, you know, in order to 
to to gain like one meter of soil for your for your uh, for your home country. I mean, we don't know that. We don't know what it is to lose like this kind of things that people in our world still experience. Uh, so that's why I made this kind of uh, maybe also a reaction about the extreme precautions mm. uh, that were being taken, uh, and even now. Mm -hmm. So, so you're, that you're, was... yeah, yeah. So you're already introducing you know, some of the persistent themes of your work, like the contrast between extremes. So as you say, utopia mm -hmm. and dystopia, um, hope and friendship versus suffering and violence. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see a lot of that in the work. And I do want to start looking at images in one second. But I wanted to ask you about um, that line that I quoted to you at the beginning about the idea of a necessary reset which mm -hmm. is something you said, of course, a, a while ago. I wonder yeah. whether that's part of the proposition of your work, whether you're trying to offer a different way of thinking, a different foundation for design, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, this, this, this topic that has to do with change has been present in my work. Uh, this work series I did, The New Tribal Labyrinth, in which I try to reinvent the Industrial Revolution by making steel and chemicals and wood and all kinds of materials in new kind of muscle power driven uh, machinery but also i make a lot of um, uh, machines of of construction machines of destruction so basically big shredders or big hammers that could rather be used to create something to destroy something, like uh, to recycle something, like you know, you you smash a, a dishwasher and then you take out the metal and the plastic and you can recycle it in order to make a much better uh, piece of equipment, or just destruction, the cause of destruction, so that you willfully break everything, so uh, that you have from the rubble you can uh, uh, restart and make a, a new, better future. Mm. Or because destruction is also fun. I mean, it's really nice to break something. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so all those pieces, um, also the works with the clocks that I think you saw in New York, <clears throat> they have to do with change. And uh, with my work, I never really try to give an answer. I just like to raise questions or to stimulate people to to this, to um, develop a dialogue about what has changed, what is good for our world, uh, what's good for our future, is it necessary, or do we need to go much further? Yeah, it's it is a, a very different um, context in which to create a design object. And one thing that strikes me particularly, I'm going to go ahead and start showing some images here, um, probably because the very first one is such a good demonstration. Um, I should say we've organized this somewhat thematically. So the first series of images will concentrate on images of the body. Um, mm -hmm. But this, this first um, early object operating table from 1984 uh, mm -hmm. is a demonstration of this. You're often um, bringing forward some very primal emotional content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as you just said, it's fun to destroy things and that idea of fun or a kind of um, playfulness even but also mm -hmm. terrifying impetus towards violence is very present in the mm -hmm. work at the same time that you're mm -hmm. thinking about grand theories of society the legacies of marxism other mm -hmm. forms of analysis um and I, I wonder if you could take us back to this very early moment in your career and say mm -hmm. something about how you got started what this object represents to you in retrospect yeah well i made this when i still was at the art school uh, this is an operation table that I fabricated out of uh, wood that I found on the street. Uh, and um, so all blew it together. And then I forged, hand forged uh, steel decorations uh, around it. And uh, so it's, a, it's an operating table. So to do good for the people, you could say, to help people to increase their quality of life. But on the other hand, it looks also pretty much like a butcher block. So that has been worn out because of uh, a lot of uh, cutting and uh, hacking. And, uh, and then you see also that's real blood, what you see. 
uh, in the surface of the, the operation table, there's all uh, tubes. So all the liquids, the, the blood, the slime, the whatever comes from the body is then collected and catched into a basin. And then in the basin, there's a little sprout that you can catch all those liquids. So it's all about this kind of creating a system to, to, to find the stuff, uh, to reuse the stuff. And this, this creating of a system or this recycling and the circular thinking has been present during our, the, the whole time. Then there are two candles on it, or like oil lamps that uh, are working on uh, lard, like human lard that you cook, and then you get the grease, and then you, you can light, put light in the operation table. And then there's two hidden stilettos that uh, there were some hidden buttons that you can activate, and then you can uh, terminate uh, your patients in case uh, the operation is uh, unsuccessful or just because you feel like it. Mm. So <laughs> to state the obvious, it's a very dark object in many respects. Well, also yeah, well, relating to the idea of medicine and healing. So yeah. you already have this idea of uh, contrast. It's, it's striking to me that you would have made this at a time when design had such different preoccupations to do with postmodernism, to do with the image uh, historicism. Mm -hmm. And this must have seemed completely off on its own <laughs> when you made it. <laughs> and I, yeah. I wonder if you could, you could sort of reconstruct your perspective at that time and what you were thinking um, and how you were thinking so differently from other designers at the moment. Well, I think if you look at me as an artist, this is already pretty weird. But if you look at me as a as a designer, then it's uh, it's really weird. Yeah. But actually, uh, I went to art school when I was sixteen, so I was pretty young. And uh, this I made. I think this is from nineteen eighty three, actually, or nineteen eighty two. Um, eighty three, I guess. Um, uh, uh, so I, I never ever saw any boundary on what is art and what's not art. So from the very early beginning, uh, I transgressed this border of functionality as is in this uh, operation table. Um, so, but I never asked myself really, is it art or is it design? Uh, I really didn't care. And, and until the very moment, uh, I think art and design is a visual communication. And then you have good art and bad art and good design and bad design. Mm. So I think um, art is not necessarily better than design yeah. or other way around. Okay. It depends completely about uh, the context. So you, you, have, you, you had um, spoken a moment ago about creation of systems. And I, I wanna go through some of these images of your work with the body. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, the body is a system already, and it has its own internal fluids and motion and circulation. Um, and I wonder mm -hmm. to what extent the body serves as a metaphor for your practice. I know it's a subject of the practice and mm -hmm. the practice, mm -hmm. but do you also think of your work as being like bodies and having the kind of internal logic and organization of a body? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the human body uh, plays an important role in my work. So not only the outside of the body, but also the internal organs, the bones, the, the system and the structures. Uh, and I made quite some functional objects like this chair or uh, like the kazanas, like a, a bar or a house inside the digestion system or the womb house, a house inside the womb. So I use the human body as like the, the major design feature or the reason for uh, making the Sphinx. And um, uh, so there are several reasons for it. First of all, I'm very much interested in the human body. So how it looks like, how it works, uh, the design of it. And um, also because you really, if you think about it, you immediately get an existential question like, you know, why? does our organs look like this uh, and why they, how they work. I mean, for many, for many aspects of the human body, people don't know 
why or how they work and um, is this uh, intelligent design is it coincident is it just uh, evolution what is it you know um, where do we come from where do we go so uh, and then basically it's the question does god exist and uh, is it coincidence is God the designer and why did he design it like that? And if God doesn't exist, who was the designer? So, uh, so it's a statement about art, about being, about uh, design. And it was also a way to get away, to put it in a, the, the form follows function in a completely different uh, perspective. Mm. Because then it's like a uh, function follows the form. Basically you have a, a large intestine and then you say, well, let's make a window here, a door, and put a bar here, put the toilet there. So it's much more like um, just taking a beautiful shape and then do whatever, uh, do, do a simple action to make it into a functional piece. Are you also thinking, Yoke, about the audience and their likely response to the work? Because mm -hmm. It seems to me that since we're walking around in our bodies, whether we understand how they work on the inside or not, the confrontation with a body-shaped object mm -hmm. could perhaps have a kind of immediacy that a more abstract form might not. And in fact, you are very, very unusual in your generation of, I'll keep calling you a designer just because we're doing design and dialogue, <laughs> but you're very unusual in your generation in introducing bodily form into functional mm -hmm. objects. I can only really think mm -hmm. of Anno Pache as somebody mm -hmm. who's equally interested in that. Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder to what extent that has to do with your um, desire to connect with people on a very kind of primary level, emotionally, let's say. Mm. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't know, I think, uh... A nice anecdote actually is uh, when I was um, like a long time ago, 15 years ago or longer even, I made this sculpture of a womb, uh, like a, a very large, like um, two meter long uh, womb uh, that, I, that I made. And I had a show in a gallery in Amsterdam. And then there was this Belgian collector, he came there. And this, uh, this collector, huge guy, uh, tall, huge hands, very loud voice. He was a retired, uh, no, he was retired. I don't know if he was a retired, but he was a gynecologist and, uh, and a big collector. So he came and said, Whoa, it's fantastic. This room house. I mean, my whole life I have been looking at those rooms and now I have the possibility to own one. And I was already happy, but I thought, hey, the guy is going to buy it, you know, because he is a gynecologist and he likes the room. And, uh, and he said, but I'm not going to buy it because it's too small. I mean, I would like to have it bigger so I can go inside with my wife, with my children, grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And then I basically said, well, it's a great idea. So why not make this huge, humongous womb that you can sleep inside and you can cook and you can go in the toilet, everything in the womb. So, um, so, so it happened. So part of it is like... Uh, finding a way, a different way of designing something, uh, a different way to make a sculpture, uh, a different way of living. Uh, but also there's an aspect of, uh, of fun. Like, you know, like, yeah, yeah why not uh, live in a womb or in an asshole or in a brain? Um, but also a kind of pathos, like this work that we're looking at now, the old man lamp. Mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm tragic it, it makes me think of Giacometti and a kind of existentialist mm -hmm. tradition perhaps um, yeah. maybe there's a bit of comedy here too the kind of I don't know the this sad sadness of the form of the drooping arm um, no, it, no 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 sort of well it does seem really tragic as well like an honest expression of what it is to age and to feel at the end of things you are such a pessimist Glenn <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, it's a totally optimistic sculpture. It's like, you know, it's basically, it's me, you know, that will continue working. I will continue creating till I really drop that. So this is about destiny. This is about um, ide ideology. This is about to be convinced about what you're doing that, you know, you will not retire. You'll just go till you, there's nothing left of you. So... 
that is just a very optimistic piece. That's I mean, funny. this is the way, I mean, I don't want to die in a car or any disease to use every cell, every atom in my body till it's uh, mm. not more possible. It makes me think of those, um, those <laughs> Renaissance figures, the écorché, the flayed figures, where all the skin is taken away. You see the muscle of the figure, and it's like uh -huh. a kind of statement about uh -huh. essential. Like when you say stripping down to the last cell, something like being mm -hmm. away so that you're showing what's inside. Um, but then you know this mm -hmm. leaning on the object, being propped up by mm -hmm. it in some way, at the last gasp. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Um, and then at the other end of the um, bi biological spectrum, we have the idea of fertility. So mm -hmm. this is a very persistent theme in your work, the idea of, um, as you already said, reproduction, procreation, mm -hmm. generation, mm -hmm. comes up over and over again in your work. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like it's a metaphor for creativity, for artistic creativity on some level? Is that one reason that you're drawn to it as a subject? Well, uh, I think uh, if you see it from an evolutionary or biological point of view, the only um, task that the human has on Earth is not to get instinct, so to reproduce, to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, if you look at it, I mean, does the human have to be big, small, happy, uh, whatever? No, it's not important. The only thing he has to do is to reproduce. So uh, that's it. Uh, so this is the most essential thing of life. Well, this is a guy by accident, but uh, a nice thing about this that is like, of course, it stands for fertility. Yeah, like, uh, but on the other hand, his penis is so big that he cannot do a lot of other things. <laughs> so yeah. He cannot walk. He cannot. I mean, this is like basically he is proud on his member, but on the other hand, he's also a prisoner yeah. of his member, so. Yeah, like a decoration on his own a little bit out to be A little bit autobiographical. <laughs> 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 Maybe we should uh, take the interview in a different direction, but um, it reminds me though, more seriously, it reminds me of the, um, the Richard Dawkins argument about the selfish gene, that we're just carriers for the DNA that we have, and the DNA is the driver of the story because it's just reproducing uh -huh. itself and we do whatever we can to reproduce the dna so we're sort of passive um you know vehicles for this mm -hmm. long evolutionary process and I, mm -hmm. I sometimes feel like the radical perspective that you bring in your work does maybe put humans in their place in a way in the same way that that argument mm -hmm. does itself as gene um Let's look at one more object for, uh, in this, this uh, group on the body. Uh, we saw earlier the idea mm -hmm. of sensory deprivation uh, chamber, mm -hmm. the skull chair. Um, one thing that you've often done is to create objects that are either literally or metaphorically wearable and change the mm -hmm. perspective, change the subjectivity of the human. Can you say a little bit about that, those forms and the idea of creating an object that transforms experience? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, uh, well, maybe a long time ago, I think even in the 90s, uh, beginning of the 90s, that I started making sensory deprivation chambers, mm -hmm. which basically is a small box that has a door and you can go inside the door and then you can sit down or lie down or do something. And the amount of space uh, that you use, that you need to go inside to sit down and to perform certain function, uh, is used to give shape to the whole object. Uh, so basically, uh, it's it's as small as you can make the thing. And the, the, the way how it looks like is just a result of the space needed on the inside. Mm. So I made a bunch of those uh, sensory deprivation chambers, but also sensory deprivation helmets. Uh, so it's a way to kind of... Uh, retreat yourself from society, you know, to get rid of all the senses, uh, the smell, the no, the, the hearing, the, the seeing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and when you do so, I mean, to find something, you also put yourself in prison. 
Uh, this is one of those large helmets, so you can take it off the lampshade. We can uh, you can take it off the stand, and you can wear it as a as a helmet. Mm. Um, that um, uh, yeah, for me, it's very difficult to make uh, or like a very pure sculpture <laughs> or a very pure design object. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the, the way that it does double duty as a lamp and a uh, speculative or uh, interruptive wearable object is fascinating to me. And that, that does seem like something that you um, do very regularly. You take everyday objects like lamps or chairs or you know things that we're very familiar with um, as design typologies, and you totally script them and think of other things that they might be or do. So that, and that seems like one of the essential features of your transformative mm -hmm. practice, taking a thing that's normally almost mm -hmm. beneath notice and turning it into this extremely, um, you know, radical, sometimes confronting object and, and possibility of experience. Mm -hmm. um, I guess this, this relates to our next theme, which is that of domestic structures. And we're now gonna look at another early work, which is this uh, project Clip-On. Uh, so here's the interior of it, and it'll make a lot more sense if I show the next image, which is this one. Um, can you say a little bit about this project and maybe also get us into the interactions that you've had with architecture mm -hmm. as a discipline? Yeah. Well, this is a piece that I made, uh, I think, um, a long time ago, 94 or something like that, mm -hmm. 92, something. And uh, the building that you see is a museum in Utrecht, a town in the Netherlands. Uh, the director at that time, uh, he said, can you make an extension to the, my room? So I made this room and if you, so it's attached to, uh, uh, to the wall, but uh, very simple means. This is the interior. So I wanted to have a table and like a day bed so uh, you could sleep a bit. Uh, this as well is uh, made according to the amount of space that you need uh, for your function. So the height is just high enough to stand or to sit or to lie down. What is an interesting feature of uh, uh, this thing is the skylights. And uh, so I made this thing. And then I said, I uh, found by myself, like it's a little bit dark, so we should have some skylights. So I took a pen and, you know, sketched some shapes on the ceiling, square, round, X shape, whatever, triangular. And I didn't like it. So I was really in a kind of a design crisis. You know, how do I make the skylights look really cool? And then, uh, but luckily I had this humongous car accident <laughs> the, the week before. Uh, and uh, basically the only thing which was left over were the floor mats of this car. The rest was completely lost. So I saw the floor mats and said, yes, <laughs> this is the shape. This is the solution. So the factor random, yeah, because this was kind of random that I had this car accident and that I had this car, the, the, the mats, the floor mats. I mean, it was like the, well, the, the, uh, the very, to me, very important uh, design factor. It's a, a the, the coincidence. Uh, you could also say it is a, it's a kind of an anti-design, like, you know, the shape. It's just a result of the functions and the skylight is uh, whatever was left of my car. Hmm. It's a fascinating story, Yop, because, um, and here we see some other images of it, um, it uh, maybe highlights the element of chance in your work, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is maybe not so obvious because your work is so sculptural and so intentional and there's so much story behind it, so much thinking behind it. But I also feel often that you're very opportunistic and that your work sort of happens maybe at the spur of the moment sometimes, but also in a way that's reactive to, um, to uh, happenstance. And I wanted to ask you about that in relationship to this famous project, AVLville, which is like mm -hmm. a, AVL, obviously, Atelier Van Lietzout, the name of your studio. Um, mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that this project really encapsulates both the idea of a total vision and also the idea mm -hmm. of random incident as as content and I, so i'd love for you to talk about this but also to talk about the relevance of of arbitrariness or randomness or chance operations in the work mm -hmm. 
Well, this is uh, called ABLville. That was a free state. In the years before that, I made a lot of um, uh, functional objects like uh, uh, we made a hospital, we made a, a workshop for weapons and bombs and a, uh, a workshop for medicines and alcohol. Uh, so a lot of water purification plants, energy plants, so uh, housing, mobile homes. So basically I made all this kind of things to be free, to be independent, to be um, not hooked up to the electricity or water purification system. So, uh, and uh, then at a certain moment, I said, okay, well, let's make a free state. Let's make a place that is completely independent where we can do whatever we want without asking for any permits. Mm -hmm. So what we did, we uh, kind of confiscated uh, a piece of uh, land in the harbor next to my studio. And we make the settlement. And uh, the idea was that everyone working in the studio, they could build their own house. There were no technical uh, requirements because if the, the house would collapse, I mean, uh, yeah, it's their fault. Uh, they should have built stronger. And also no aesthetical uh, limitation. So if people want to buy a, a to build design a very ugly house, then that's fine. So this kind of a total, uh, total freedom, total freedom of expression, total uh, whatever uh, was important uh, for this uh, free state. Uh, we also had uh, very, very big problems with the authorities. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I always... Uh, <laughs> So we also, well, we had like, uh, we, we made our own money. We had a restaurant, a nightclub without the license. We had uh, our own flag. We had our own farm, uh, heating and energy system, purification. So uh, uh, I thought that uh, uh, the bureaucracy in the Netherlands was hopefully, uh, hopelessly uh, inefficient. And they wouldn't even know that I was there, but uh, uh, they found out. <laughs> and uh, actually, the anecdote is, uh, is pretty funny. So uh, it was pretty successful, and all the newspapers wrote about it, you know, the good ones. And then at a certain moment, the local newspapers start writing about it. So it's the newspaper that they read in City Hall. And then I make this famous quote. So like in Avialville, in the free state, you can do whatever you want. If you want to have sex with your dog, I mean, you know, be my guest. And then we got like a lot of protests, uh, a lot of animal protectionists and uh, uh, Christian uh, fundamentalists that say, no, 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 you cannot have uh, sex with animals and uh, you have to close down because this is not good, that is not good. So we existed for almost one year mm -hmm. and then uh, we were closed down. I don't think there was an answer to your question, right? <laughs> Well, uh, you are answering it in a way because what I was asking about was the toleration of random chance and this idea yeah. of putting a situation in which absolutely anything can happen, including bestiality even, but also from an yeah. old design point of view, there's an absolute lack of control, but that, that is yeah. the value, um, which I suppose is the value of freedom in a pure form. That was what you were experimenting with here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Anarchy, in a way. Um, yeah. but, it, but it relates to these other, you've already mentioned this um, the idea of the wearable thing, but looking at it in relation to AVLville, um, it also strikes me that there's something here about autonomy. So mm -hmm. the idea of AVLville being detached or separatist and not mm -hmm. obeying the usual dictates of authority, the law, government, mm -hmm regulation that that all is refused it seems like a grand scale version in some ways of the radical autonomy that this idea of, of sensory deprivation kind of crawling inside your own head um, might mm -hmm. suggest and I, I wonder what your thoughts are about that idea of autonomy as a political proposition whether autonomy of the self like the body or autonomy of a community this idea of detachment and separation mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, uh, everyone should can should be able to decide about his own body. Uh, so that's like uh, really up to. I don't think it's a question of the state that decides me 
whether I can, uh, 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 how to say, do euthanasia or something like that. It's my own decision. As long as you don't harm other people with it, I think you are the boss of your own body. Uh, with uh, society, uh, it's more, I have a very ambiguous uh, uh, idea. So on one hand, I like to create a better world, uh, a cleaner world, a more efficient world, a uh, greener world. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I also like to be completely um, independent. And on the other hand, I mean, the society in which we live, the democracy, uh, of course, it's you know pretty good, although I think that uh, it suffers from the bureaucracy and uh, uh, it suffers from the uh, unwillingness of a lot of people to take any risk. So everything has to be safe, everything has to be uh, uh, responsible. So very few things can really happen uh because of that reason so for example uh especially in the netherlands i mean of course we want to have green energy but then there's huge protests against windmills and solar panels because people think this is like a pollution of the horizon and so you get like everyone has to say uh, everyone can have their opinion and by doing that it also blocks the uh, progress mm. and i think that's this this lack of uh, leadership or this lack of uh, 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 vision that sometimes is uh, bothering me. Yeah, I'm just showing so, yeah. some, some other images of um, yeah. th these various kinds of uh, sculptural and architectural gestures that, again, seem to me to be about a sense of enclosed autonomy or free space, sometimes protected. Here, the relationship to Giacometti seems particularly clear, um, perhaps, but um, I feel like very often you're intervening into a social fabric in this extremely intense way, either through an image as we see here, or a structure like the cabin, mm -hmm. or the wearable object, or a whole village, um, in a way that seems maybe more about creating a rift or a separation from our usual way of thinking about things. It seems like a disruptive strategy, if I may say, rather than a proposal about how society might actually be structured. Mm -hmm. it's, it seems like not, not utopian in that sense. You know, utopian literature often presents a whole account of how we might live instead. Mm -hmm. And I feel like yeah. you're, you're not usually doing that or, or maybe ever doing that. You're more cutting open the fabric so we can see through it. I will try to explain that. First of all, this piece is not uh, inspired by Giacometti, but uh, much older uh, uh, prehistoric uh, sculptures right. that I saw in some museum. But then the figure on top of it is built in a very geometric way. So basically you see like on one hand is uh, uh, the archetypal, uh, archaic, I mean, uh, chariot. And on the other hand, the geometric figure that stands for progress. So you see primitive and progress uh, opposite each other. Yeah. Um, about, um, no, I've, I think uh, if you make something that is one dimensional, uh, and one dimensional, I mean, uh, this is our, our ideal and this is how we see it. I think it becomes um, um, a little bit boring and I don't think you have the same effect. I think if you have disruption, uh, your brain uh, will, um, will uh, register, register that and start thinking about it because there is something wrong. So I have to think, I have to make my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, like a photorealistic uh, scan or uh, uh, painting of a person, it is not interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and and if, uh, a sculpture, which is like Giacometti, for example, very thin, it's like people say, yeah, but this is not like, like reality. Why is it so thin? So you start thinking. So I, in order to communicate an idea, you have to 
bring people, put people on the, on the wrong leg, so to bring them out of balance. Yeah. Uh, so they will start thinking about it. So I, I never think that art uh, should give an answer. Uh, art should raise questions. Uh, art should make people wonder, should make people dream. Um, so I think that's why I, I combine this, the good, the bad, and the ugly in almost every piece. So you never know if it's good or if it's bad. I mean, is this just like a, a nice way to make a small hotel room? Or is this the, the famous guy that has sex with his dog? Yeah. Or is this just two robots uh, uh, playing? We don't know. Yeah, the, the, also there's, uh, of course, humor <laughs> here. So, you know, you're almost making fun of yourself for having gotten in trouble at AVLville for this stray comment. And it's obviously absurd, you know, this idea of like taking a dog from, from behind as an architectural uh, premise. And there's also something there about satire, touching uh, hands with um, the legacy of modernism, which is so serious. So this mm -hmm. is like bathroom humor meets Le Corbusier, in a way, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, but I, I, I really take your point about uh, p putting people on the wrong foot and sort of getting them destabilized so that you can engage with them on a different basis, I suppose, in some way. Actually, this piece has a quite interesting uh, explanation. So it's called the domesticator. So it's about domestication. And basically, it's about design. It's about the ability of the human being to influence nature, to influence the world, to influence our surrounding. And, you know, that started with uh, the first thing, the club, the weapon uh, that the human find to improve their situation and to kill other people. But those... Uh, Things like the plow, uh, the invention of the room, the industrial revolution, the invention of uh, fertilizer. So basically all those kinds of inventions, they were made by humans to increase the quality of life, to increase the possibility to influence, uh, or to, to conquer, uh, to control nature. And um, all those inventions, I mean, made us what we are now. We are not uh, hunter-gatherers, but we are... Uh, uh, artists, designers, uh, all kind of people doing stuff. But every time this new invention comes, there is a, also the, there is a shift in, ethical, in ethics, like uh, with the good and the bad. And this, of course, is happening at the very moment. At the moment, uh, this new domestication process has to do with um, genetic manipulation, uh, big data, uh, uh, life enhancement, uh, algorithms. So all this kind of things that we do to improve our quality of our life, but also are causing, uh, in, I would say, uh, maybe un, um, un, un, um, I don't know the word, uh, uh, an irreversible uh, effects on our society. I mean, the way how we are grown together with our telephones and data it's well at least to say a little bit uh, scary so mm -hmm. this piece basically is about this awareness of uh, uh, the, the the pros and contrasts the, the the fantastic and the the horrible of new uh, the, the, the new developments in our society yeah although it, it also does seem to me to have another meaning which is as a personal emblem I don't know if you would agree with this, but it's one of your most prominent uh, projects that's been around the world, um, as we saw it was at the Pompidou. And because yeah. it does have that reference to this other event in your biography, it does feel mm -hmm. a little bit like, I don't want to say an alter ego, but it, it, you know, it also, it sort of looks like a logo even from a certain point of view. Like I, I think of this as such a representative work of you as a person and as a creator. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you look at it that way, though. Well, no, I mean, no, I, no, I do so many different things. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah. this has been published a lot. So for outsiders, this might be very important. Yeah. But for me, it was just another house. <laughs> okay. Next, next, <laughs> next. 
So as I told you, I prefer to make twenty thousand, uh, no, ten thousand bad sculptures than ten good ones. Yeah, or ten thousand bad buildings, <laughs> or good buildings. Yeah, yeah. They sometimes turn out to be good ones too. Yeah. So here we here we see um, one last architectural project: the original dwelling. This I thought was interesting just because of how it shot. Like it's it's it really gets across the idea that it's a building that's also a sculpture because it's under lights and inside, so it's contained mm -hmm. in a way. I just thought that was that was a kind of fascinating thing. Mm -hmm. But um, maybe more pertinently, here we also see this idea of a very futuristic building that also is a little bit like a cave, maybe. And mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. there's an element of systemic thinking, which you mentioned all the way at the beginning when we were talking about the operating table, this idea of kind of internal systems. And I often mm -hmm. feel like you're relating different kinds of systems like a, a natural system, like underwater caverns or mm -hmm. the organs of the body and then architectural systems. This seems like a really good example of that. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe you could tell us a little bit about this project and, and the thinking behind it. Well, here also, uh, I, I would like, I'm highlighting this uh, primitivism, expressionism on the one hand and the progression and modernism on the other hand. So. It's a kind of a cave dwelling and uh, looks like a natural cave, but in fact, it's sculpted uh, and basically in the same system as the, the clip on. So what space do you need to sit down, to walk around, to go to the bar, to have a drink, to go to the toilet, to go to the, the play then. Um, so it's the ultimate form follows function. Of course, it's like uh, we need to have this stuff. So. This is logic. On the other hand, it goes back to the, the earliest dwellings of humans that they, they live in caves and uh, caverns. Uh, and also, it also remembers a little bit like um, well, James Bond or what kind of futurist, modernist, bachelor <laughs> fantasies uh, from film. So basically, this, uh, this piece brings together a lot of things like sculpture, forms follows function, primitivism, the earliest dwelling, and kind of futurist, modernist uh, uh, ideology. Yep. Are you um, actively engaged with design history and architectural history as well? Because this, for example, this one makes me think of Friedrich Kiesler, the great surrealist architect. Mm -hmm. it makes me think of mm -hmm. Anne Farm and their house of the future, I think it was called in the late 60s, or Paolo Soleri, various kind of a radical architecture of the 1960s. Is that something that's kind of mm -hmm. in your head, these historical 20th century references or not so much? Uh, no, of course, I know uh, many of them. And uh, I guess they were inspirational as well. Um, but um, uh, in working, uh, making sculpture or designing, I'm very intuitive. So mm -hmm. I just, start you know with the chainsaw and a pile of uh, styrofoam and then a couple of days later it's something else yeah. and um, so I'm um, no I'm not that theoretically involved in giving the solution I mean I, mm -hmm. I I I see I look I create and then after that I start thinking yeah, okay. Or maybe <laughs> Probably it's the opposite that many people, uh, that people say you should do first thing, then create, but. Uh... Yeah, well, th that's a great segue to our last uh, subject, which is tools, machines, and systems. So I, I think people are already getting a sense of how prodigious you are and productive. And I should stress that we're only seeing the smallest facet of what you've produced over the past 35 years, almost 40 years. Um, I mean, it's an absolutely enormous body of work. And as you said, in the last year, when forced into your own studio, you've only become more productive and that's been your response. Um, so we have here a few images of objects that themselves could be understood as machines or tools. So I'd love to hear you talk about that, but I'd also love to hear you talk about just the ongoing frenzy of making that you're involved with and what mm -hmm. that, why that's so important or why you do it? Is it just instinct or is there a kind of message behind that hyper productivity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what you see here is the chicken of the future. And uh, 
it's part of this crypto futurism series uh, uh, and also related to the domesticator like you know what do we do in the future for food do we still keep chicken that you know have a horrible life in a cage and eat uh, stupid food and create chicken uh, eggs or just try really try to make a new kind of organism without uh, awareness uh, that can produce uh, eggs so basically if you go back to the chicken uh, you put in uh, food water and semen and then out comes like humongous eggs so as a kind of a, a way to modify uh, nature to the ultimate domestication that's to annihilate annihilate the animal yeah um yeah and a, re a replacement of the biological with something else whether it's yeah basically it's also a way to uh to be more sustainable to feed uh, large quantities of people uh mm -hmm. on the other hand i mean you you take away the, the origin of the egg which is the chicken yeah yeah and i, I did want to show just show people that this is a persistent theme again so this idea of creating these kind of fantastic yeah. this yeah Yeah, this is related to the chicken of the farm, uh, the chicken of the future. Yeah, yeah. So you, you throw in garbage and then uh, yogurt or some kind of food comes out. Right. And, and what about this, um, this question of the actual making process and the productivity that you're engaged mm -hmm. with? Do you have any comment on that? Yeah. No. Um, uh no i i just like to work and uh i i don't like to work slow i mean i like to work fast i mean i like to work with my body uh my hands my feet my eyes everything uh, i need to to have a physical interaction with the material and my tools mm -hmm. so that's why uh, i well, I make a lot of stuff. I mean, it's not, I mean, I, I think I could make much more. I mean, you yeah. think it's a lot. I think it's just like a fraction of what yeah. I would like to do. Yeah. Well, but they also have, yeah. it, it also raises the question. It's interesting you say that because I was just about to ask you about the relationship between the human scale, the human body, and industry. Because, mm -hmm. of course, what if you really want to see, is, things being made in quantity, you go to a factory, you don't go to an artist studio, mm -hmm. right? So there's also mm -hmm. a, a quantitative issue that you're confronting. And you already mentioned back mm -hmm. at the beginning of our conversation, the way that you re-script the industrial revolution in various imaginative mm -hmm. ways. And this last group of images really shows how you're doing that. So I, I would love to yeah. hear you talk about industry in this case it's agricultural industry the sort of systematization mm -hmm. of growth of food but can you talk about yeah. what industry means to you and how you're trying to address that topic yeah well a thing i mean the the, the image that you saw uh, are mostly of uh, sculptures installations uh, uh, things we about design or art but I also made like real design products like office chairs and kitchen chairs and tables and recliners, lazy boys. Uh, and those pieces, uh, they are industrially produced and sold for very reasonable uh, prices. So this is also uh, something important to me that, uh, if, that I also want uh, to create like normal stuff, good normal stuff that can be produced industrially. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I love industry. I, I, I like, <laughs> just like industry, I like chimneys, I like uh, uh, materials and waste and all this kind of thing. I have this romantic feeling about it. This, uh, this is not an agricultural machine, but basically it's um, a compactor. So uh, it's a machine of destruction. Uh, actually, I got the idea to make this when I was at the Basel Art Fair, like uh, 10 years ago. And I was so disappointed in the quality of the art. It was only painting and very expensive stuff. And I just had like a little corner somewhere and I said, what the fuck is this the art world is this the most important art fair i mean 
fuck it. I mean, I wish I had a steamroller and I would just drive through the art fair with my steamroller. And then I said, oh, well, actually, it's a quite a good idea. So I make this kind of, um, it's not a steamroller, but it's a, it's a roller, a diesel roller. So you can, um, you can, it's a machine of destruction. And this machine of destruction, of course, is like I said before, like the hammer, it's a machine to create stuff, to uh, destroy stuff, to recycle stuff. And uh, so this is, uh, it's not for agriculture, it's just to, to, uh, to, um, to get rid of uh, our, our uh, culture. <laughs> well, it's, it's like an anti-agriculture maybe. <laughs> and it's, the title means the flying Dutchman, correct? It is, yes, yeah. Which is maybe kind of a self-portrait, could I say? Uh, no, no, no. It was uh, uh, the title came from this uh, famous opera of Wagner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of this uh, uh, guy that uh, he was a captain of a ship, and he was going to the east, and he wanted to go home uh, very quickly. So he made a, a deal with the devil that he could uh, go in I don't know six weeks instead of three months, and. Um, but the cause of that, he was uh, doomed, and that he, uh, what was the story again, uh, that uh, he would be doomed forever and would never die, but uh, once every seven years, he could go ashore and uh, to find a woman. And if he would find a woman that would be loyal to him, because he was a, a hedonist guy, loyal to him till his death, then uh, he would be, uh, he would go to heaven as well. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but the story went wrong, but uh, he went to hell. So yeah. maybe we do another podcast about uh, the Flying Ditchman okay. and all the good of that things he did. <laughs> okay, um, th there's something in that project, of just the, the gesture about destruction, that also mm -hmm. raises the question of force. Mm -hmm. and obviously, the scale of that project, the um, one we were mm -hmm. just looking at, is also expressed in. A series of other projects that you've done that are about weight, about compression, about mm -hmm. you know industrial scale power, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, which yeah. it seems to me like you're communicating that to us in very palpable ways um, through mm -hmm. like this one, which um, suggests some element of compression. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about this uh, series of process-based artworks? Yeah. So I was making, shaping or sculpting with force and of course also coincidence, randomness, because uh, uh, well, you cannot control the force. Uh, this is uh, what you could say a sculpture. So I make this construction out of solid oak wood and then I added a hydraulic cylinder and then you push it apart and then the wood breaks, the steel breaks. Then I put extra steel, put extra wood. So till a certain moment, you, I got an interesting shape, but more interesting for um, for this podcast is that I uh, I also make a lot of design products like that lamps mm. that were created with a hammer or uh, 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 other pieces that um, I had I had this hydraulic pump that produced its um, seven hundred bar so it's a humongous pressure you can't imagine and then. I just uh, make a construction out of tubes and then attach it to the machine and then this piece just exploded. Mm. And then the shape that you have uh, was the result of, um, of uh, this, this force, uh, unpredictable. And, uh, and that's why it was good. Mm. And you, see, uh, you see there in the middle, you see like one of the broken gas tanks on the left in the middle, the gray one. Yeah. And I made uh, lamps and this kind of stuff. Uh, so I put an exploded gas tank and put a lampshade on it and a plug, and then it's uh, it's done. Yeah. So it becomes like a relic of this uh, encounter with massive force. And you know, one thing that occurs to me there is that you're maybe pointing us to the fact that humans now have control over forces that previously were reserved for nature. I mean, it's like the force of a mountain or an ocean that's being created by a machine. So it's like this industrial sublime in a way, maybe. And mm -hmm. as you think about what humans are really capable of and channeling all of that power. 
Yeah, you could also see it's the ultimate uh, anti-object or anti-design. So you don't design, you uh, you you destroy something. It's the opposite of creating, and then uh, use that shape to to make it into a functional object. So it's the the total refusion to take a pen yeah. and a piece of paper or a computer to, to design something pretty. Yeah. Um here's a detail of that. The, the, there's a, this is also just super interesting. You alluded earlier to the interest in clocks and measurement and regulation. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a very powerful example of that where you're taking clockwork and raising it to this enormous scale and then it regulates mm -hmm. these other systems and forces that are in play. Um, mm -hmm. Let's um, finish up with this um, thing. <laughs> I don't know what to call it. Architectural project, sculpture, mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, the blast furnace and this is actually mm -hmm. the first time we met one another it was a pioneer works when the blast furnace mm -hmm. was displayed there although here i think mm -hmm. it's shown it, this is in its present location at art omai is that right that's correct yeah so just north of me here in the hudson valley actually so you can go and see mm -hmm. it um and this project again obviously relates to the idea of the industrial revolution so the technology and imagery seems grounded in kind of earlier moments of uh, technological progress, but mm -hmm. one thing that's extremely important about it is that it seems like something you can live inside, like it has a toilet mm -hmm. that's outfitted mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. and it's like a furnace or a chunk of a factory that's also like a house. And I wonder if you could mm -hmm. talk about that idea of inhabitable technology that's represented in this work. Mm -hmm. So this piece uh, is actually a reaction uh, on the, pre the situation when I made it, let's say, I don't know, eight years ago, um, which you saw like a, a giant outsourcing of industry uh, to the cheapest possible countries. Um, uh, so, and then we in the West, uh, we would be reduced to bureaucrats, uh, technocrats, uh, uh, service, service industry people. Uh, and then there's just ships going with the product. So basically, uh, we don't have a connection to raw materials or factories uh, again, and we are just uh, consumers. So as a reaction to that, I say, okay, now let's make local, let's produce local, let's reinvent our industry. And in this case, it's a blast furnace, which is um, an industrial uh, equipment where you can make steel out of coal and iron ore. And uh, like that, you can uh, make your your own steel uh, and this actually was connected to treadmills so you also didn't need electricity just the coal and iron ore and then you can make um, your own steel and and this is of course is a highly utopian uh, ideal project because i mean with this machine which could function if you would really finish it uh, it looks like a blast furnace you could create steel uh, but at humongous cost, yeah, because it's it's not as efficient as the the modern ones. But it is your own steel, and with this uh, you can also make your own products. So you know, cast iron, uh, uh, frying pans, or simple equipment of cast iron. So it's an attempt to go back to the origin of our culture, to go back to the origin of design, uh, industrial design to go back to raw materials, to basically go back to, to the world, to uh, the, the, the origin. And um, I created this machine, but I also created the surrounding where the people, uh, 12 people or so that would live day and night there because it's a 24 hours uh, process. Uh, so it, between all the equipment, you find the toilets and kitchen, bathrooms, uh, uh, chairs uh, and that is to indicate that uh, those people that the tribe of the metal workers are so dedicated so in love so convinced of their metal making that they say we want to live inside the blast furnace but they have a, a lot of heat and noise and and dust and that they would like to become one with the machine to become one with the industry so that the, the human and the machine uh, becomes one. So that is the, uh, the idea of uh, the new idealism. 
Um, that's our last image. Um, and it, uh -huh. it leads me only to ask you one more question, Yoke, which is about your overall oeuvre or all of your output, your career, you take it as a, as a totality. Um, would you say that in some ways it's like the blast furnace writ large in the sense that what you've done is show what one person can do which as you say, might seem like a little, but it also might seem like a lot, just like the, the possibility of human scale. And also an attempt, even if it's a quixotic attempt, in other words, something you can try to do, but only fail to do, to actually um, mm -hmm. draw the means of production, both conceptual and physical into your own control. Um, I mean, it, it uh -huh. seems like in some ways, your work over the past decades, when you add it all together, almost seems like an experimental demonstration of what it is possible for a human being to accomplish. You see what I mean? Like a, a real measure of that mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah. No, I mean, I always have been interested in creating other worlds except the world that we know. Uh, without that them being a, a solution really so uh, in that sense uh, I also never want to finish <laughs> to finish something completely so let's say the last 15% uh, uh, should uh, <laughs> should stay unfinished so it will never really work okay. well that's a nice <laughs> note to end it on nicely open-ended and um and it's going to be amazing to see what you've done in the past year. I can't wait to <laughs> find out. More about it. To. Thank you so much for joining for this conversation. It's been a pleasure and very illuminating, as always, with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.